if you have any dignity. Apologize to the podcast. Are you sure what you're doing is absolutely right? Right? Don't you see him? He's perfect for it. Besides, I've changed the enzyme. It's got to work this time. A physical and a psychological change. We'll keep records on every move he makes. That's not what I mean. Do you have the right to do this to him? After all, the others were different. They volunteered. But Tara, he's exactly the type I need. This is for science, for human knowledge. What happens to one man doesn't make any difference. You didn't seem to care for the others, Tara. I forgot how to care about anybody a long time ago. You ought to know that. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Apologize the Podcast. This is episode 16 on the movie The Manster. Half man, half monster. And um, I go by Jalman22. You can find my stuff on YouTube. And with me... It's me, AJ, from the Don't Ignore Me YouTube channel. And we have not been ignoring you. So we come back from a short little hiatus. Um, work schedules and school schedules and all that other good stuff has kept us from uh, from recording. Life can be so much fun. Especially life under capitalism. Cap- oh, yes. Yes. Or life in... Uh, you, you know, capitalism will work. I don't really have anything else to add. But I thought, well, you know, we might as well try this new... Um, I think it's called Ever. This application that you can buy for your computer. And we're actually... This is the first episode we're recording via Skype. So hopefully everything turns out fine. Hopefully everything will be good. Um, the only downside to recording with Skype is if there's any little background noise, it'll catch it. So if I leave Facebook on or I leave... I'm, I'm never really on Twitter, but if I leave anything on Twitter or something, it'll make a little Dean noise. So if you hear a little notification noise, d- don't worry. You're, you're fine. Nothing blew up. Or maybe something did blow up. Oh, well, we're going to assume the best and hope nothing blew up. But um, I'm all ready. It's a little early, so I have my delicious um, French vanilla coffee. And I am all set to watch a Japanese and American co-production. Uh, I love things that are produced in America and Japan simultaneously. I know. Well, as long as it's not the Roland Emmerich Godzilla, then I'm okay. Yeah, that one is uh, not not as fun. That one, that one's scary. That that might be a movie we might need to talk about on the podcast. Except, you know, it might give me an aneurysm or an ulcer. Uh, although that is that is true, we could talk about it. On the other hand, I feel like I've seen it enough for one lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> we, well, we could just record an episode without watching it and just kind of phone it in, like they did with the movie. Um, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, well, um. We're going to get ready to go ahead and go watch the movie, but some quick stuff on the film. This is a, um, a 1959 um, horror movie, or monster movie, uh, called The Manster. And it was mostly an American production, shot in Japan, and you'll notice there's a lot of familiar faces uh, from Toho science fiction films. Um, especially um, especially um, Jerry Ito, who plays Nelson, the evil mixed caucasian villain of mothra the, who kidnaps the twin fairies in mothra um so it's really weird seeing him talking with his actual voice and not the super exaggerated cartoon villain voice they give him in the dub of the uh the original mothra so this will be a little interesting um every time i see him pop up in the movie it always takes me aback because uh, i'm so used to seeing him in mothra but um this is this is a fun short little monster movie. It's very sleazy, very cheap, and it was a staple of you know multiple uh, horror host shows, you know like Monster Vision and Elvira. So this is kind of a nice little cozy Friday morning kind of monster movie to watch. Yeah, it's perfect for epic Friday mornings. Morning, Friday morning. mornings. We don't need Saturday mornings. <laughs> I miss Saturday mornings. I miss, but that's well, topic for another day. Yeah, I, I, well, I miss having like a nice lineup now. Whenever you try to turn on Saturday morning cartoons, it's like, oh, oh, we got stuff from Cubo from Canada. Uh, that's yeah. something. Well, it's it's a little different for me, because considering that I've pretty much been working every Saturday morning for the past four or five years now. So <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I mean, we could always recreate Saturday mornings. Did I tell you what my perfect Saturday morning lineup would be? No, but I'm sure it sucks. I no, it does not suck. Well, I don't know. Some people might think it sucks, but uh, my perfect Saturday morning lineup would be uh, an episode or two of Ultraman, then an episode or two of Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, all you know, kind of the Dragon Ball universe. Um, an episode of Rocky and Bullwinkle, um, one monster movie of some kind, and then finish up the day with some Looney Tunes. That, that, that doesn't sound as sucky as I thought, but I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't worry, I don't have, like, you know, Beyblade or Yu-Gi-Oh! or something. I mean, don't get me wrong, I like Yu-Gi-Oh! Bridge, but I'm not really sure if I could watch Yu-Gi-Oh! the show show the original show well you know i mean it he did i mean he, one thing little Kribo likes to do is to actually include some of the lines verbatim from the dub and it sometimes they do come out pretty funny so <laughs> mm-hmm. oh there goes the first the first notification thing Oh, Lord. I get more spam mail from Donald Trump. Well, anyway, this is supposed to be an introduction, so um, I'm going to leave you on that terrifying thought of Donald Trump. So um, we're going to go and watch the movie, and we'll be right back after uh, this little commercial break, and we will be back with our thoughts on The Manster. Half man, half monster. Apologize, the podcast will be right back. Mwahaha. Hello, and welcome to a commercial for Hello, This is the Doom Show. I'm Richard. I'm Brad. And on the podcast that is known as Hello, This is the Doom Show, we talk about giallo movies, slasher movies, horror movies. We're going to interview Cary Grant live in the studio. We're going to interview Lucio Fulci in the studio, folks. We're going to put Cary Grant in the studio with Lucio Fulci. It's the interview you never thought would happen. I'm going to wear my Vincent Price flex. I'm going to wear my Citizen Kane wristwatch and monocle. And now Brad is going to recite the Pledge of Allegiance in Portuguese. Brad, go. I don't have Portuguese. Go! Go! Stop hitting me! You're a natural actor. Yeah. Um, you can listen to us at hello doomed show.podomatic.com or you can find the archive at doomsmoviethon.com Well, welcome back, everybody. We just finished The Manster. And before we start the... Huh? I I just said The Manster. The Manster. Um, Well, before we get going, I just had one thing that I had to say. I am totally 35. How old are you, Mr. Stanford? 35? (laughs) Me too. Yeah, let me just say that was probably the most baffling part of the whole movie. Not the whole weird pseudoscience or terrible misogyny or adultery being okay or having the most dedicated wife of all time no the fact that our hero is supposed to be 35 is just baffling because he looks like he's probably 57 or something maybe maybe we just do aging with like inflation now or something yeah yeah i think it's because of you know coke industries ointment or something that makes it so <laughs> young at 35. Yum, yum, 35 did it. Too much hard drugs and too much liquor. Well, um, yeah. so yeah, so I guess we're going to do a little bit of trivia, and then we'll do our um, our initial thoughts of um, the mainster. Um, this was a um, American and Japanese co-production. Um, pretty much it was just an American movie that was filmed partially in Japan, um, I'm, I'm assuming it's mostly the help of Toho Studios because the few Japanese actors that we do see in the movie were contract players for, um, for Toho and they're the company that made the Godzilla films and 
other kaiju egg. Uh, and... Do we know four was with Toho though? Well, when I was looking on IMDb, it didn't actually say connected to Toho. So it's mainly an American movie with some Japanese influence. Right. So, um, and what's and ver- what's really odd, though, is trying to research some of the actors in this movie was very um, challenging, to say the least. But anyway, there is one book that has some information on the mainster. It's um, Japanese Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films, a Critical Analyst and filmography of 103 features released in the United States, 1950 to 1992. So, even though it's mostly an American movie, it is covered in some Japanese reference books, like this one. It's definitely an odd cookie of a movie, I'll, I'll definitely say that. Um, but that's, yeah, that's very easy to say. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I'd say it's mostly an American movie with a little bit of um, Japanese influence. So, um, the movie was directed by George B. Brakeston and Kenneth G. Crane, and, um, both of those sound like fake names, and they don't really have a lot of, uh, movies to their, uh, name. Uh, the most famous film they've made is The okay. Mainster. Perhaps, um, perhaps they're pseudonyms, not pseudonames. Pseudonyme, there you go. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so... Um, going on to the cast, um, we got Peter Denley who, as Larry, who is totally 35. I don't believe that one iota. How old are you, Mr. Stanford? 35. Forgive me. I am st- I'm learning Japanese, but I, my pronunciation is still bad. But um, uh, the main scientist, who was uh, Robert, <laughs> was, uh, or Dr. Um, you know, Dr. Uh, Suzuki was uh, Tensu uh, Namarara, and he was, um, a, I guess, a Canadian-Japanese actor. Um, his He said he was actually born in Canada, and one of his parents is Canadian. Um, but he spoke fluent English, so he could kind of bounce around and dub his own voice and be in um, Japanese and American movies. Um, mm. He's also in Mothra in The Last Dinosaur, and one of my personal favorites, uh, Latitude Zero, which is probably one of the wackiest non-Godzilla Toho science fiction films. The most baffling one was the Japanese-American actress, which little is known about, which is Terry uh, Zimnan. Or uh-huh. Zimnan. Uh, it's Zimmer with an N at the end. And pretty much there is nothing about her on the internet. Um, I looked up her IMDb biography, and it said, an actress associated with the mainster. And that's it? That That is it. And I looked around at other sources, and yeah, pretty much nothing is listed for this actress. Um, so this is very mysterious. Maybe we should start, like, an investigation woman was, because um, she really did only a couple movies, and the only one really listed is the mainster. Um... And that's really about it. So if there anyone knows, please chime in because um, I'm completely baffled. And I wasn't even sure if she was a American actress in Yellowface or if she was actually a Japanese American actress. Yeah, I had the same problems. I just I couldn't tell which which it was supposed to be. I mean, I if could, it was Yellowface, it was done very tastefully. But um, yeah, <laughs> she didn't look completely Japanese. Um, and then, of course, um, like I said, this movie was the staple, uh, well, like I said in the introduction, this movie was a staple of uh, many different horror host shows, including Elvira's Movie Macabre, and most famously for being on the best of the worst of Monster Vision, which, um, luckily, some kind soul on YouTube has posted a lot of commercials and advertisements and all sorts of knickknacks for Monster Vision. Next Saturday night, Penn and Teller run barefoot through the best of the worst. Night of the Leapest, Queen of Outer Space, Attack of the 50-Foot Woman, Plan 9 from Outer Space, The Monster and Billy the Kid versus Dracula. In that order, it's Monster Vision, a simple television experiment gone completely berserk. And uh, not really to go on too much of a tangent, but um, there's been kind of a resurgence with um, Monster Vision clips, and most recently, James Rolfe, who uh, who who runs uh, Cinemassacre went and did this huge endeavor 
doing a high def remastered um, introduction for Monster Vision, where he looked at the same intro that was from a VHS tape, and he just found all the different clips from all the movies and edited it together and made a remastered um, version of the Monster Vision intro. So that's a really cool endeavor and something really neat, you know? Yeah. So, um, also, the movie was, um, it goes under a bunch of different aliases. Are you ready for some of these titles? Oh, no, I, I, mm, well, I can't wait. Well, some of them are actually pretty obvious, because mainly the movie is about a double-headed monster. So, one of the titles is called The Two-Headed Monster. Uh, well, that seems obvious. Okay, so the other one is called The Split, which is kind of a spoiler well, towards the end of the movie. Uh, yeah. The Japanese title, Shona, uh, Shoto no Sachajinchi. Um, I probably butched that title up, but that is the Japanese title. And then, guess what the title is in Germany? Frankenstein Conquers the Manster. <laughs> no, but that would be a great movie. I think I need to make that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dr. Frankenstein, what have you done? Um, no, the um, the German title is Dr. Satan. Dr. Satan, huh? Dr. Satan. But it's spelled, uh, doctor is spelled uh, D-O-K-T-O-R. So, Dr. Satan. Right. Yes. So, um... And really, the last um, the last piece of uh, real trivia I have is um, what probably one of the most bizarre double features of all time. When this movie was first released in the United States, it was released as a double feature with uh, George Franju's uh, 1959 uh, French horror masterpiece *Eyes Without a Face*. And of course, *Eyes Without a Face* inspired many like-minded um, surgical horror movies. Everything from Jess Franco's Awful Dr. Orloff to a remake that he made um, called Faceless. You know, go figure. Mm-hmm. Eyes Without Face, Faceless. Um, and then it, it, it went on to inspire even such high-budget Spanish horror movies as 2011's The Skin I Live In by uh, Pedro Amador. But what's really interesting is the American title of Eyes Without the Face was called The Horror Chamber of Dr. Faustus. Huh. So can you imagine going to a movie um, in 1959 and being the mainster and the horror chamber of Dr. Faustus? That doesn't really make much sense, though, because that doesn't... doesn't be, there, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, there is kind of a chamber, but it's not really, like, the same thing. Well, I mean, that's the title of, of the French movie, not the mainster. Oh, sorry. So yeah, it, but the the but if you watch the eyes without a face, there's no character named Doctor Faustus. Yeah. So uh, I guess a more appropriate double feature would be Doctor Satan and the horror chamber of Doctor Faustus. But um, actually, you know good. what? I'll um I'll play the trailer like right here in a break, and and we'll 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 show that. cabinet of Dr. Caligari have critics been so enthusiastic. Never before have audiences been so terrified. Never again will you experience a tale of terror to compare with the horror chamber of Dr. Faustus. Here is a strange and fascinating motion picture that the London Observer compared with the ghastly elegance that often suggests Tennessee Williams in one of his more abnormal moods. A mature horror film that the Paris critics called worthy of the great horror classics of our time. Starring Pierre Brazer as the depraved scientist who used beautiful women in the most frightening way imaginable. Alida Valley as the accomplice who procured the young girls he needed so desperately. 
Juliette Magnel as the innocent victim of a madman's perversity. The Horror Chamber of Dr. Faustus. Motion picture as fascinating as it is fantastic, as unusual as it is shocking, as frightening as anything you will ever see on a motion picture screen. <laughs> From the exotic geisha houses of Tokyo to the back alleys of the Ginza Strip comes the terrifying news of a fiendish creature that threatens to destroy all who stand in his way. This is the frightening story of an American reporter in Tokyo who unwittingly became the victim of a shocking scientific experiment that turned him into a horrible mutant, half man, half monster, the Manster. He got away. I think I know where he's going, to Taurus. Follow me. Right. There's panic in the streets as the unheard of terror of a half-man, half-monster runs wild through the city. There he goes! Don't miss The Manster, a genuine thriller in the most frightening sense of the word. Okay, so now that we're back from the trailer, um, and of course, this movie is part of the um, the notorious subgenre of two-headed um, monster movies. Um, Wait, there's is... a subgenre about that? <laughs> yeah, because there's also the man with two heads and the incredible two-headed transplant. Huh. So it's part of this little subgenre of uh, two-headed monster movies. This is probably one of the more disturbing ones, because both of those... Uh, other two films, Man with Two Heads and Incredible Two-Headed Transplant. Both of those are more like comedies, and this one's more dead serious, even though it is kind of comical. Mm -hmm. Really, that's really all I had to say with trivia, so I guess we'll talk about The Mainster. So, I definitely think it's an interesting film. Uh, pretty much to sum up the plot, um, we have Dr. Robert... Um, oh, phooey. Well, yeah, Dr. Robert Suki. Sorry, I had a brain fart there. And he's experimenting with these weird chemicals that are supposed to morph humans. And some of his experiments have turned terribly wrong. And um, what, as, as he was, I guess, killing one of his other uh, patients, um, we meet our, our detect, I mean, we meet our um, reporter friend, Larry, um, who is totally 35, who is a American reporter <laughs> living in Japan who wants to quit the biz to go live with his very respectable wife back in the United States. And, of course... He's for foreign correspondent. Yeah, he's the foreign correspondent. And, um, of course, things don't go too well for Larry, as he's given some really bad whiskey and <laughs> drugged. And um, pretty, pretty much that's really it. Um, he goes with adventures with Dr. Uh, Sukiyaki, and... Um, they uh they pretty much just go to different geisha houses and uh peter starts going with um <laughs> or larry sorry i keep getting the actor's name and the character's name mixed up um but larry starts you know having adultery and getting drunk at geisha houses and um his his work ethic just goes to shit and and all that goodness and of course he soon finds out that he uh is got another head growing in his shoulder and he is becoming a monster or a manster. So what did you think of the mainster AJ? The, the, the movie or the creature? Oh, well both. Did, did you like the creature design? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I guess so. I mean, it was, uh, I mean, I don't know if I could call it super, a super original design. I mean, all it really does is add the two heads. Um, I think, I, I suppose the way they had him transform. I mean, I I guess that's slightly more original, just because of 
I feel like a lot of the times when you have a guy transforming into a monster, they like do it um, all at once, kind of like with like the Wolfman, where he just where they do like those shots where it you know it's one minute he's regular human and then a couple of frames they change to and then he's full Wolfman or whatever. But at least with this, it was like a slow, gradual transition that he was actually aware of. He was just too stupid to really do anything about it. <laughs> but. <laughs> Yeah, he was having too much hot flames with geisha girls. Yeah, he's just like, oh, I just, bur- I mean, I have a monster hand, but I just burned my hand, that's all. It's like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had too much bad whiskey, it's just a bad hangover. There's nothing wrong with me. Well, what about the um, the actual uh, movie? Well, overall, you know, I, I can't say that um, this is a, uh, a great movie. I would have to, I mean, th- if, if I had to compare it to another movie, I would definitely have to compare it to the... Um, to Bride of, Bride of the Gorilla, um, because it's basically, in, in many ways, it's kind of the same movie, but just taking place in a different area and uh, with with some different some different things. But basically, you know, the whole general plot of a man uh, something happens to a guy uh, to a man who that turns him into a monster over time, and his wife is concerned, you know. Those kind of basic plot elements are all there. And so it's not really a super original concept of regular humans turning into monsters somehow and terrorizing people and killing people. Although I think probably what the most disappointing thing for this movie for me was that, like, I mean, I did know it was a, um, you know, Japanese-American co-production. But really, I felt like this is probably, like, the least Japanese mo- uh, movie that was made in Japan that I've ever seen. Um, it, it like as you kind of said, it basically is an American movie with in in a Japanese setting, and it's not that necessarily that that, that makes it like bad per se. It's just that um, I was I was kind of hoping for more of the Japanese style and the Japanese influence because I kind of feel like the American like because it was because the style was overly American and didn't really have very much Japanese influence. It just kind of became a, a, a much more stock American movie instead of um, what I expect from Japan. Just, I mean, just for example, like it's you know, um, you know what I do ex- like what what I expect from Japanese monster movies is kaiju, and the monster is much more of like is not is very much not like a kaiju at all. He's much more like a. Uh, a traditional universal horror monster, which yeah. I hope I hope I don't get roasted at the stake for this, but I I would probably choose kaiju over um, universal horror. Yeah, werewolves and-, and vampires and stuff, because really the monster is more of a. I mean, if you take aside the fact it's a two headed monster and kind of a yeti, it's more of like the werewolf as he slowly changes into it at night. You know, right? So I mean, like I get I I suppose. I suppose I really wouldn't have like if 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 this was just straight up an American movie that took like t- that took place in America, which really it could have been because I don't feel like there was anything particular about the setting that couldn't have that made it unique in a way that uh, you couldn't have the exact same plot other places. I suppose the only thing that really was like felt Japanese, I guess, was when they went to the uh, to the hot springs because of. As far as I know, Japan is the only culture that really kind of do- has the um, the hot spring business the way that they do, um, uh-huh. and that, that 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 part definitely felt Japanese. But the rest of it, I felt like you could just transplant in the plot and everything to other places, and it wouldn't have made any difference, especially considering the fact that almost all the actors were white anyway. So <laughs> yeah. Well, or, you know, that or the fact that most of them were Japanese-American. Um, the, uh, the the mad scientist character is really the only Japanese actor, you know, there. Um, you know, maybe you could say Jerry Ito, but Jerry Ito is an American, uh, Japanese, er- he's a Japanese-American actor. And really, he wouldn't get his strive until you know, Mothra in a couple of years. Cause this movie came out in 1959 and Mothra was being made in 1960 and released in 1961, um, you know, closer to 62. Right. Well, you know, it's not even necessarily that for me, it's not necessarily that like, Oh, well the actors are Japanese American as opposed to just Japanese. That's, I mean, 
Uh, obviously, I mean, perhaps that might matter more to some people than to others. But I, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking overall in terms of the plot, like, uh, all the important character, I mean, almost all the important characters were white. And, yeah. and it, you know, I think the main issue with that is just that, like, if I'm seeing a bunch of white actors who are acting in the, in the American style with the, with an American style plot, it becomes really hard to argue that this is, um, all that influenced by Japan. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I kind of see what you mean. Um, I mean, yeah, this really didn't feel like a typical, uh, kaiju movie. Um, and kind of to clear any a ways. I mean, I know that kaiju means monster in, in Japan, but when we say kaiju, it's very distinctly, the Japanese style, um, you know, well, having I, I, a man in suit or having, you know, a lot of suitmation stuff, you know, thinking something more along Godzilla, or if you're going to just have a humanoid monster, something like War of the Gargantuans. Right. Um, well, I was, I was going to say one thing really quick. Um, another reason why it's definitely not Kaiju is, is because of, um, like, you know, usually when you think, Usually when you say kaiju, you think of, like, the giant kaiju like Godzilla who are, you know, destroying the, the countryside. But, of course, you also have the kaiju as well and, and uh, you know, like the Super Sentai shows where they start out as human size and then usually they end up growing. But the point is, is that, like, you know, Japanese kaiju can be human sized and be a human sized monster, but usually they are in a suit and usually they're much more original and or at least have a, a more like eye popping design um, than simply like, Oh, he has two heads and he's almost kind of like a werewolf, but not really, you know? Yeah. Um, so like for me looking at it like that, what I saw looked very, very American and not really Japanese uh, almost at all. So <laughs> yeah. Well, you could say it's almost kind of a, I mean, the plot is kind of more American because it's all about, you know, obviously the main protagonist who's, a, am going to call an astagonist because he's a complete jerk, but we'll get to that later, is, um, you know, it is kind of a more American-centric story because, you know, the, the main character is American. And part of the story, um, trying to have an American point of view, is he's kind of isolated. He's in this weird culture. Uh, before he goes to the hot springs, when he's just having uh, drinks with uh, the, you know, with the doctor, and he's, you know, getting drunk with the geisha girls and flirting with the geisha girls, uh, you know, he says he hasn't really had a, he hasn't had time to actually experience Japan and get to know its culture. He's just been being a foreign correspondent, so he's been kind of stuck in his work. Kumpai, as we say in America, bottoms up. You know, Doc, I don't know which I like better. Japanese sake or Japanese geisha? What's the difference? Plenty of both here. No, seriously, Doc. I've never had time before to do this sort of thing. You have no idea how stuffy these political interviews and press conferences can be. With so little time left, please, let me be your host and let me show you things you have never seen before in Japan. I've been working rather hard myself lately. Larry, I like you and... uh, I'd like to show you more of Japan. Doc, you've got yourself a deal. Kanpai. Bottoms up. So right. he's kind of... Part of the story is, you know, he's kind of in a weird place. He's stuck in this odd situation because he's not used to being in Japan. And, and I guess part of the horror... If, if the movie is a little more well-made, uh, we could kind of see, like, more of, of his paranoia. And it's kind of a... It's kind of a... A metaphor in a, in a weird way of oh you're stuck in this foreign land you're being consumed by its culture but that's probably reading too much into this you know cheesy movie and i hate to say cheesy but it, it was pretty cheesy in parts oh yeah it's definitely cheesy <laughs> oh yeah but i mean it, it just seems like part of the the oddness of the situation is it's you know he's stuck in this foreign land that he's not used to and he's being changed into a monster. And then it could also be read as, you know, oh no, the evil, um, you know, American culture is coming and trying to destroy 
uh, <laughs> Japanese culture. But um, well, you know, I, I I suppose that well, I, I I think you can you could probably make that point mainly just because of like I I can only imagine what this must have felt like for the people who watched it in Japan. I don't know if they'd be like disappointed or not per se, but it's like if I were if 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 I were promised as like oh this is like a, a Japanese American co-production like I felt like it was more like all American Japan just just you know gave them permission to film more or yeah. less like that's about it and really but, other than some of the scenes in the countryside most of this could have been recreated in sets and I'm sure they probably did recreate a lot of the Japanese places in America and they just filmed there because there was there really wasn't a lot of you know sightseeing other than oh look we're in a cramped hotel or look we're near Mount Fuji and uh, we're in this evil lab I mean most of it was sets there really wasn't a lot of outdoor locations to kind of show off the beautiful scenery of Japan and most of the movie right. takes place at night so I mean it's not like you would really see much of it anyway yeah I think I think that's that's a, that's a really good point because. Like I mean, Japan as like I I guess you could say they didn't use they didn't take any advantage of the um of the country that they were filming in because I mean they if they filmed on location in Japan I think they ought to have uh made more uh made made more beautiful scenery shots or used better locations besides it, it like even even the outdoor shots they used I'm. They to me they looked like they could have just been on sets and they probably they might have been so I don't know yeah and and, and it really sucks because it makes me wish there was a a better transfer of this movie um it's it's fallen to the public domain so that's why you could watch it on YouTube and not have to worry about it being uh, taken down and it's yeah. it's usually included in any like monster movie box set from Mill Creek like I have two different copies of it on DVD, they're in 50 movie packs, and pretty much any cheap DVD company can release it. Um, but it makes me wish that there was a, you know, like a Blu-ray edition with a cleaned up copy, uh, maybe with a Japanese version, maybe there's differences there, um, and, mm. and definitely a commentary with some film historians, because, you know, as much as I like to think so, I'm definitely not an expert on this movie, or, you know, many Japanese films. So it'd be really cool to see, you know, someone like August Ragoni or uh, Stuart Galbraith or Steve Rifle, you know, right, you know, actually talk about the movie in a commentary. I just don't think there's enough interest. I guess it's too much of a niche market, you know? Yeah, yeah, I think, well, yeah, because I, I, I think this, this movie would definitely probably fall to the wayside in terms of getting attention just because, um, you know, it's not really, uh, it's, it's def it, I don't think it has enough Japanese flavor to really interest the Japanese film historians and excuse me. And I think it's too standard as well. Uh, it, I think it's too kind of standard and basic a movie for the uh, American film historians as well. So I think it fits in a kind of weird um, niche between the two that probably, I think it's like trying to satisfy too many people and not really succeeding. <laughs> yeah. That, <laughs> That's going to be on the box. <laughs> Tries to satisfy too many people and <laughs> fails. Yeah. Well, we could probably release it. We, I mean, it is in the public domain. So, I mean, you know. <laughs> we, we could we could make our first Apologize the Podcast DVD. <laughs> oh, my. Anyway. Um, so, I mean, going back to the whole uh, co-production angle. I mean, and... Not really to go too far away from the monster aspect. I mean, like you were saying, a lot of this plays out like a typical American monster movie. And what makes, in my opinion, most Japanese monster movies stand out. There is a few exceptions that are kind of more generic. Um, as much as I love the monster Varan, Varan the Unbelievable, um, or Daikaiju Varan, is... It's kind of a flat movie, uh, so there is a couple kaiju movies that aren't really that good, or you know some that are just really badly made. Um, as much as me and you love uh, Godzilla vs. Megalon, we can admit that it is a pretty badly made film um, and pretty cheap. Yeah. But for the most part, most of these uh, kaiju films have a lot more going for them. Um, there's a lot more subtext, there's a lot more 
um, you know, themes and messages, um, especially the films with uh, directed by Ashira Honda. Um, if you look at the original Godzilla or Mothra or Rodan or, or, or even something like War of the Gargantuans, there's usually better production values and more of a point to the story, you know. I mean, that was definitely lacking from this film. Um, and it did feel cheap, and I'm, I'm thinking that's mostly the American influence. And one thing I wanted to kind of point out, I'm not sure if you noticed, it's it's shot very much like an American film. Usually, oh, yeah. yeah, usually Japanese uh, movies, unless they're kind of thrown together, have better cinematography and better, well, I mean, yeah, just better camera movements and better, um, you know, set design, and usually the camera angles are a little more impressive. You know, they kind of, they're photographed very well and they're kind of staged very well. This was more like a TV movie because it had lots of close-ups on people's face, uh, faces. Yeah. It was very flat, you know? It, it it wasn't really well composed at all, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I mean, I think especially the way they used um, a lot of, like, the darkness and shadows, like, as we kind of touched on before, like, there, it, there's a lot of darkness in the movie. It takes place a, a whole lot of it at night. Uh-huh. Well, I kind of feel like um, a lot of the the darkness that they used, it's just kind of like a, I mean, obviously, I know it's in black and white, but I'm just saying in terms of the lighting, I think they kind of overdid it a little bit on, like, everything was in shadow. Like, I, to be honest, I don't even, especially... I especially noticed it when they were like showing the monsters, um, like showing the monster. And I, I, I know obviously when you when you show off the monsters, you you want to have them in the most kind of menacing light. But at the same time, I don't think it was really until the end, the ending fight, that I actually got a good look at exactly what the monster is supposed to look like. Because it was everything else was just kind of cloaked in shadow the whole time. So yeah. I don't know. You know, and I'd say probably you know it it does have a look of a film noir, um, and it's kind of a more American style. But I will say, even though the the cinematography is pretty flat, I did like most of the lighting. I mean, I thought the movie was really moody, um, and it kind of has this you know, feeling of 50s films that you don't get anymore with with that film noir lighting. Because especially towards the end where Jerry Ito is the main detective, is chasing the mainster, and he's sitting there in his trench coat, and he's wearing his fedora, and he's got his gun out. Um, you know, the scenes with him kind of running around, like, that's well shot. But when it's people sitting around a geisha house, there's there's not really much to it. Like, usually with Japanese movies, everything's really well composed, uh, it's very artistic. There's usually something in the foreground to give it depth and kind of show off the exoticness, you know, because to us Americans, you know, tea houses and hot springs and, you know, j just a normal Japanese apartment from from the post-war era, you know, it has so much, you know, exoticness to us. And in this movie, it just looked like cheap, ho you know, hotel rooms, you know? Yeah, I yeah, I definitely agree. Like, and, and I think that adds to the much more of an, of an American feel um, to them. It's almost like, I mean, I, I can imagine since it was a co-production that perhaps they wanted to have the rooms look more Japanese, but like perhaps the, uh, the director or whatever was just like, Hey, let's, we don't, we don't need this, uh, this stuff. Or perhaps they just started out making it very minimalist mm -hmm. uh, and not really have a Japanese feel to most of the locations. And, you know, like I said, I mean, we're, I know we're kind of dogging on the film. I, I do really enjoy this as a cheesy piece of, uh, of beef mo be movie dumb. It's, it's definitely unique, but, uh, I feel like, you know, if we, if we could kind of sum up our disappointment, it's for a movie that is supposed to be partially a Japanese horror film. It really does drop the ball. Um, so are, are you ready to move on to the cast members? Uh, well, I guess I'll, I guess I'll I'll try to de to defend or whatever as well. Um, I don't necessarily think like I, I don't hate the movie either. Um, I think I could I think I like it just about as much as I like Ride of the Gorilla, which you know it's kind of um, you know it's not my favorite genre and it's not uh, and I and I think it's um, pretty interesting, but it does become a derivative. I think where my disappointment with this movie lies is mainly just in like. For me, hearing the promise of a Japanese co-production may heighten my expectations 
to have something closer to a kaiju film or um, something that could actually be said to be a blend of the two styles as opposed to just, oh, this is just an American style movie. Yeah. But that, that's really my only, that's really my only complaint because I mean, as an American movie or as a more or less American movie on its own, I don't really have a problem with it. I think it's more of just like expectation versus reality. And, and like, you know, and like we've both kind of said, you know, we don't have problems with American horror movies or, you know, monster movies of the fifties, but the Japanese films were in a, a different category of their own. I mean, they are, you know, f for the time being, I mean, a lot of filmmakers will agree like George Lucas and Steven Spielberg that, the Japanese science fiction films were probably the best made science fiction movies of the 50s and the 60s. And the 70s, not so much because of slashed budgets and having to compete with television. Um, and also, of course, we get stuff like Star Wars and Jaws in the 70s that kind of blew them out of the water. But the Japanese, when you hear a Japanese science fiction movie, it has a level of quality that can't be matched by um, American exploitation, you know? Right. Um, if, if you're ready to move on, um, what, what's yeah, interesting <laughs> about you bringing up Bride of the Gorilla is, uh, when we were watching the movie, uh, you said something about the, the main character running around looking a little bit like, uh, Raymond Burr. Oh yeah, that's right. I, 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 I think that the main, um, the main protagonist, um, he, Larry. he, I, I called him a diet Raymond Burr. <laughs> <laughs> that needs to go on the DVD cover too, starring diet Raymond Burr. Yeah, because, I mean, he kind of, like, I mean, uh, his voice kind of sounds like Raymond Burr's a little bit, kind of like just like the, the, I mean, well, granted, he kind of sounds like every American protagonist at that time who just kind of has that, that, that deep growl a little bit. But, um, but I think it, but even in terms of his looks and, and just kind of his acting style, he reminded me of Raymond Burr, but... Of course, no one could beat the amazing Raymond Burr, but... Um. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, Raymond Burr is definitely one of my favorite 50s actors, and I feel bad because I should I should watch more Perry Mason, but I usually get distracted, and it's usually on TV too early in the morning for me, you know? So I always miss the first half of the case. But um, yeah. what's, what's, what's funny about it is you said Raymond Burr, well... In Bride of the Gorilla, we have Raymond Burr as kind of the Lon Chaney character in The Wolfman. And then you have Lon Chaney Jr. actually in Bride of the Gorilla, who's playing the sheriff, you know, playing the uh, chief police officer. Yeah, um, yeah. And then you go to this movie, The Mainster, and it's kind of yet another uh, werewolf story in a weird way. And honestly, there was a couple shots where... Um, the, the main character, you know, Peter uh, Dinley, he kind of looked like um, he kind of looked like a really washed up Lon Chaney Jr. Um, because I know towards the end, Lon Chaney Jr. was kind of not looking too, you know, too good because of all his years of alcohol abuse. But um, I mean, it was kind of weird. So in some parts, he looked like Raymond Burr and some parts he looked like a lesser Lon Chaney Jr. So it kind of had both of them. So it really does connect to Bride of the Gorilla. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I bet they probably did that on purpose, maybe. Yeah, like I mean, honestly, I would prefer... I think one thing that would make The Mainster a better movie, uh, where it would go from kind of a okay, passable monster movie to a great monster movie, is if they would have actually had, like, Raymond Burr. Imagine how much better this film would be if Raymond Burr was the protagonist Larry. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean... <laughs> I mean, I mean, just his intensity would blow the movie out of the water, you know? Yeah, I think, and um, I think it might have made a lot of scenes better because, like, when he's um, arguing with his wife and uh, when he's, like, concerned about becoming a monster, like, I can, I can see Raymond Burr, like, like, for, like when he had the um, hand in his, in his pocket and he's just like, oh, I got it was just a burn or whatever. Like, I can see Raymond Burr doing that. And oh, yeah. I think it'd be a lot more uh, believable and better. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and, and I think the problem with our main character, Larry, is he's not very sympathetic. I mean, he's uh, maybe it was more acceptable in 50 science fiction, but he really does come off as an asshole, which, you know, if I was if I didn't enjoy it so much, it would probably be a downside of the movie. But actually, most of the the joy and kind of the unintentional comedy of the movie came from just how 
blatant he was about, oh, I, I'm happily married. Oh, wait a minute, you're a hot geisha girl. I'm going to hit on you and we're yeah. going to get drunk together. Uh, <laughs> you know? I, yeah, I kind of think that was one of the big problems, just in terms of like, you know, when I, when I uh, at the very beginning, when he was going to the to the house and he, like, we knew that Robert, the the evil scientist, was up to no good, and he was going to try to, you know, turn him into the manster or whatever. I mean, it was pretty, even though they didn't directly say it, it was pretty obvious what was going on. But I guess, I don't think we spent enough time with him to, before he started turning into the manster, for him to be sympathetic at all, because by the time he started doing jerky things, like cheating on his wife, and, well... That's probably the biggest thing, cheating on his wife constantly. But like, we didn't really get a we, we we didn't really get a chance to see him as a oh no he's a good man he's the you know like the re like what exactly is it about him that makes his wife so loyal to him like yeah he, he, he doesn't seem like the kind of guy who'd be worth it you know based on what we see of him and and that's a good point his wife is so extremely loyal like it's almost comical like just how devoted she is to to him you know maybe he's just really special or something you know yeah i'm sure he's i mean i'm sure he's a nice i mean maybe maybe he was a nice guy but we just don't we don't really get to um we just don't really get to see that i guess is the main um main issue so it's not really it's kind of unknown if it's if if we can really believe that he's supposedly this nice guy in reality Like, we were told that, but we don't really see it, I guess. Yeah, right. I guess being a four correspondent and being the oldest-looking 35-year-old does that to you, you know? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just going to have that clip so I can just randomly pop that on people. I'm 35. No, you're not. <laughs> so I guess, yeah, that's kind of his problem is he's just so unsympathetic. And maybe it's just in the writing, or maybe it's because he looks like a very rapey version of Raymond Burr and Lon Chaney Jr. Um, yeah. I did like the scenes where it was showing him as the mainster, like wanting to, uh, to strangle people and the look on his face of just like, Grr, you know? Yeah. But, um, I guess, uh, moving on. I mean, yeah, I think the movie would have benefited from having a stronger presence as the lead because I, I know they were going for someone like an every man that we could relate to, but I can't relate to a cheating bastard, so, <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. But um, I guess every every couple of movies, we have to have one unsympathetic protagonist. Well, moving on with uh, Tetsu um, Nakamura um, as our evil Dr. Robert, who they try to make more sympathetic towards the end. I thought, I actually thought he was probably one of the better elements of the movie. Um, especially seeing him as you know, an evil henchman in all the different Toho movies or as a sympathetic scientist who's kidnapped and, you know, Latitude Zero. Uh, what did you think of him as the evil Dr. Robert? Yeah, well, um, I think he was, I don't know, I guess he's kind of a, a weird character because on the one hand, we were supposed to feel something about him when it's like, it's revealed like, oh, he turned his wife into a monster. But then he's like, he's like, oh, well, I'm just doing this for science, but... And he and he's that's what he seems all concerned about. He he doesn't seem like he's purposely trying to to like destroy the world or anything. Like he, I I I mean, I guess I suppose the the easiest way to put it is that it's a very instrumental rationality in the name of enlightenment. Basically, is what he's trying to to do. Mm -hmm. Um, But he doesn't he just doesn't care about that he has to ruin this guy's life in order to do it. But but at the same time, he's different from other from other evil doctors, like, for example, um, the, uh, the doctor from, like, the, um, the Island of Dr. Monroe, is that right? Oh, the, uh, are you talking about Island of the Lost Souls with Charles Lawton? Yeah, the, uh, yeah, the, the one the, where it's, um, where he has the tribe of, of, uh, like, ape-like people. Yeah, the one um, with Bill Lugosi in it with the House of Pain. Yes, the, yeah. What okay. was the movie called again? Uh, Island of the Lost Souls. But it sorry, is based sorry, on um, Island of Dr. Moreau. It's just, it's the only one of the three movies that's not called Island of Dr. Moreau. Okay, well, I'm glad I, I'm glad I was on to it. But anyway, but it's, it's like, he's a different kind of mad scientist than him because of, he, like, um, Dr. Moreau seemed much more, like, sadistic. And considering he has to keep, like, he has to, you know, keep on making these ape creatures and 
doing terrible things to them. Like he seems more sadistic than Dr. Robert, who who it appears just kind of wants to get good publications or whatever, you know, and he's just kind of trying to, he, he's just like genuinely curious as to what's going to happen to this guy mm-hmm. that he's, what he's done to him as opposed to really trying to do something sinister with it, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, that makes sense, but yeah, I can kind of see your confusion because he, he constantly is, you know, trying to defend why he's doing this to Larry or why he turned the other people into monsters and why he's experimenting. But, um, but throughout the movie, when he's kind of observing him, it keeps showing these really weird close-ups of the doctor and he looks like he's kind of like enjoying that he's slowly going crazy. It's just kind of really weird because it's like we're told one thing from him, but then the movie is constantly showing us close-ups of him kind of looking either really attracted to Larry or really like excited that he's changing and like fascinated with what's about to happen. But some of it could be easily misread as, oh, he's just, you know, he's just evil, you know? Yeah, and well, he also he also disappears for a good part of the movie, so it comes kind of um, like to figuring out what his motives are and why he's doing this. Like, if 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 they included him more, kind of like near the end of like, oh, like I love the fact that he's killing people, or you know, oh, what have I done, or just something. But it appears that like with with that absence, it just kind of seems. Like, he doesn't really have much of a plan besides science! Science! Yeah, and, and that's that's a good point. Um, you know, I mean, he does seem like a, a really miswritten character because from one scene to the next, you're not really sure. And yeah, he does kind of drop out of the movie and we have to focus on, uh, you know, uh, Larry running around and kidnapping random Japanese girls and killing them and strangling them and uh, mostly off off camera um and then also you know you you i mean you do see him towards the end and it looks like he's going to commit suicide so he is kind of honorable but mostly i do enjoy his performance when he is on screen because you know he is fluent in english he has kind of this deep you know sinister voice in some scenes so i kind of wish he was in more american movies as the bad guy i mean not to create a stereotype of japanese villains but you know what i mean yeah because i mean he he really is a good actor and until i saw this movie and saw some other uh toho science fiction movies that weren't godzilla based um i really only remember him as being one of um one of the you know henchmen in mothra so i'm glad he was kind of a bigger actor than just a extra who looked really menacing right um which I guess moving on, um, would, would you want to go ahead and start talking about Jerry Ito as the uh, head sign? I mean, the uh, head um, inspector. Uh, well, I mean, sure we can. Although to be honest, I, just, I don't really have all that much to say about him because he wasn't really in it all that much. Yeah. Well, I guess really the biggest thing you can say is it's um, it's just interesting to see them in a movie together before Mothra, because he is Jerry Ito's main sidekick in Mothra. Um, mm. I mean, I like him. I, I kind of, I'm, with with Jerry Ito, it's kind of weird hearing his normal voice because I'm so used to the comical dub where he's kind of like this evil villain who one second sounds like Boris, uh, you know, Boris uh, Beninoff. And then one scene yeah, yeah. seems like, you know, a villain from Scooby-Doo. But um, obviously he's not given as much to do as Nelson and Mothra. But um, I, I think he has a cool presence, and I kind of wish he was in more of these movies as different characters, you know? Yeah. Okay, well, um, I guess uh, moving on to other people in the cast. Um, obviously, okay, so I guess since we've kind of hinted at that the wife is comically uh, devoted to, to Larry, I think she's probably the most faithful wife in all of movies, you know? Stand it me longer. Ian wouldn't tell me a thing, but it wasn't hard to guess that you'd found company. Sorry, Larry. Yeah, sure. All right, let's not draw this one out. Let's make it front page, top banner line now. So you found out, so what? Darling, I... I came here so as I could see you. So as you could see me. I don't want things to go on this way, Larry. You've got to make a choice right now. The girlfriend or me.
Tara, I don't think we're wanted here. Let's go someplace and finish the evening. Good night, Mrs. Stanford. Larry, I'll wait here till midnight, then I'm leaving. The choice is yours. I made my choice. Oh, Ian. Ian, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Fight. That's all you can do. I want to fight, Ian. But he's changed. He's, he's so different. There's still hope. Oh, yeah, I definitely, I mean, yeah, I definitely agree just because of, like, she, like, I mean, she, she goes to Japan trying to meet with her husband, but she's not expecting him to, uh, to, to be cheating on, on her, but the first thing he does is he walks in the room with another woman, and she's not even shocked or crying or anything, she's just like, oh, well, <laughs> I'll wait for you here, you got <laughs> boys will be night. boys, me or her. And like, and and he actually has, of course, he actually has the gall to leave with um with Doctor Robert's assistant instead of staying with his wife. And it's like, I mean, we don't we don't even have any we we don't have any reason to believe that um she's like a bad wife or anything. But I, I suppose it's just the I don't know. I, I guess they didn't really they didn't really explain this, but but I I guess they're implying that there's something in the. Uh, there's something in the uh, the potion or whatever that he got to turn him into the manster that makes him want to be a jerk and cheat on his wife and go with his with Doctor Roberts' assistant or whatever. So I guess that's the explanation we get. Yeah, we have to figure it out for I mean, ourselves. It's supposed to bring out his Jekyll side, which is kind of weird. I mean, his Hyde side of like the whole Doctor Jekyll, Mister Hyde, um, you know, mythos, but. Right. Um, but that's not really really well conveyed until the end so it's kind of just he just comes off as a jerk but i mean the whole movie he seems like he's just a jerk so he just becomes a bigger jerk you know exactly um well the the actress who plays linda his wife is jane um um helton helton yeah um and she is i mean she she isn't really much of a character other than she's devoted wife and dear lord does she sell the crap out of that <laughs> yeah like the whole movie like she's almost strangled by him she witnesses him with another woman uh she's verbally abused and she's just like there's something wrong with larry he he's just he's just not right but i'll stand by him and and even towards the end uh one thing you pointed out was um the volcano which we're assuming is mount fuji that's behind Dr. Robert's laboratory. It looks like it's a couple miles away. And um, you were saying, kinda... oh, wow, did they really run a couple of miles to get to that, to that mountain? Um, but it, it's just funny. Like, even when they're chasing the mainster, she's the first one to get in the line and, like, book it. Like, no, Larry! <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, and, she, I mean, she must have been like a cross country runner or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think that that whole scene is kind of funny because, like, it looks like Mount Fuji is like so far back in the distance, yet we just do a jump cut and they're already there. But yeah, well, I mean, we're assuming it's Mount Fuji because it's never really named in the film, and of course, it's going off, which I don't think most volcanoes in Japan explode like that. So, um, that's one set piece that added to the movie, you know? But, um, so yeah, I mean, she, the wife is interesting. She's, um, definitely a character. So, I guess moving on in the cast, uh, Terry Zinner, there, like, like we said at the beginning, there is really nothing known about this woman on the internet. Maybe I'm looking in the wrong places or reading the wrong books, but I haven't been able to find anything other than she is this mysterious actress. So... Um, but she had a good presence. I could see her being a femme fatale in uh, more monster movies if she was given the chance. You think so? Huh? <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I thought she was cute enough, and she was kind of dark. But a lot of it was just listen to my accent, and I'm I'm adulterous woman. So that's that's really about the main cast. Um, the only one I can else I can think of is um, is Larry's boss. Which is, uh, I guess, hold on, was, yes, that was his name. Okay. Uh, was Norman Van uh, Hawkland, um, or as Van Hawkland. Um, so he's, he's, P, uh, he's uh, Larry's boss. And really, about the only caricature he's really given is a comically huge pipe. Mm. <laughs> so, 
I, I just thought that was funny that I could see a really terrible, like, Chubby Chasers version of uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes with him, you know, smoking that pipe. Um, and even towards the end, he's just, like, monologuing about philosophy. And I'm just like, oh, please, where's the scientist? He's like, I, I'm not a philosopher, I'm a reporter, but... Why does it have to happen? Why? I don't know, Linda. He was an average sort of guy, the image of us all. How can I say this? There was good in Larry and there was evil. The evil part broke through, took hold. Call it an accident or call it a warning. A warning? I'm a reporter, not a mystic, Linda. But there are things beyond us, things perhaps we're not meant to understand. So, um, so that's mainly the cast. Um, I, I guess production values, we've kind of already hinted at that this is kind of a cheaper movie. Um, and one scene that I actually thought was really comical is every time they're walking to uh, Dr. Roberts' uh, laboratory up the mountain, there's really no walkway or steps or anything. So there's constantly these establishing shots showing various characters struggling to get to this laboratory and um and, and when it shows you know larry trying to climb the uh trying to climb the mountain he's struggling i'm like oh yep this is a stereotypical drunk american yeah uh, so i mean that's that's really about it i mean i'd say um i guess kind of moving towards uh closing thoughts um I mean, some of the photography looks good. Most of it's pretty flat. And I do enjoy the acting, but I there's no way I could say that this is a high-quality monster movie. It's definitely a memorable uh, monster movie. Eh, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> um, I Well, I mean, I think it's memorable. I think I've seen this movie probably about ten times, and I know we were trying to think of a monster movie to watch, and um, I was like, ooh, the mainster. Uh, and the selling point is it's a Japanese co-production, but as we as we've kind of already said, it's for a Japanese co-production, it's pretty flat, and it's more of just a basic American monster movie in Japan. You know, yeah. I think there's some good parts to it, and it's definitely a fascinating movie. And if some company would be nice enough to release a Blu-ray of it, I wouldn't turn it down. I'd definitely buy it the first week, and especially if it had a lot of extras and stuff. You know, right. So what what's some of your closing thoughts on the mainster? Yeah, well, overall, um, I think I mean I kind of put it in the same category as like um, Bride of the Gorilla, and it has um, uh, I mean there's there's so many um, there's so many monster movies that were made in this kind of style and this kind of um, uh, kind of the similar plot structure um, during this era. And, um, I mean, I definitely can't say it's like my favorite genre in general. Uh, I think for, for what it was, it was, it was, it was entertaining. I didn't dislike it. Um, as I've kind of said, I think the main thing was just the dichotomy of like, well, is this more Japanese or is this more American? And it ended up being a lot more American, which, which isn't bad per se, but I think I would, I think I would have liked to see a better balance of the, of, of influence there. Yeah. That's that's really I think that's really my probably my main complaint because I guess I feel like if it would have had more Japanese influence then I could have called that could have said this is a much more unique movie even if it's even though who knows maybe maybe having more Japanese influence wouldn't have made it better I don't know but <laughs> yeah uh, I mean, that's a good that's a good point and um, so yeah that's kind of our thoughts on the mainster um, I guess real quick before we uh, before we close out. Um, would this probably be the bottom of the barrel of of kai of, of Japanese monster movies or monster movies in general for you? Uh, you know, sadly, I think um, yeah, I guess I guess I couldn't. I, I'd have to say this is probably my least favorite Japanese monster movie. But if you now, but but then again, if you include it, if if you compare it to like other American American monster movies, then I'd say it's pretty average. But I don't know. I, I guess it, I mean, again, I hate to keep repeat, repeating myself. But I guess I just expect a lot more from from Japanese um, as opposed to my my Ameri like um, my expectations for American monster movies are very different. So, yeah, and I would kind of say the same thing. I mean, is is, you know, if I had to compare any other uh, kaiju movie from Japan, not not including uh, Korea or Hong Kong. 
um, or any various um, Asian countries. If I'm if I'm st- sticking strictly to American movies, I think the mainster. If you want to kind of loop it up with other Japanese American co-productions, or um, I guess in a weird way, like cut and paste movies, where they inserted American actors, like the American version of Gamera or right. uh, Godzilla King of the Monsters. I think those are still better movies. Um, and out of the two, I think Godzilla King of the Monsters is... I mean, even if we didn't have the Japanese version, it's still a damn good movie. Um, mm. And then Gamera, The Incredible, um, the American re-edit with Brian Denny, uh, with Brian Denny added. Um, that one's not as good. It's a little slower. Um, and then, of course, Gigantus, the fire monster, the the American version of Godzilla Raids again is just a masterpiece in badness. Um, yeah. Oh, banana oil. Um, but anyway, um, I would probably say that this movie would be below those, uh, maybe tied with Gamera, the Incredible. Um, but then compared to actual kaiju movies, I'd say it's still better than some of the, the lesser um kaiju films like i think varan the unbelievable is not as memorable as this so i'm kind of being generous with it but overall it it's definitely towards the bottom of the barrel when it comes to uh japanese monster movies yeah so yeah I so but i mean i'm glad we still watched it and i think we had a good conversation with it and it's definitely a, a enjoyable movie for science yeah. And, I, I'd have to give it a, a 35 out of 100. A 35 out of 100? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow, science. Oh, what about 35 gigawatts out of 100? Uh, I'll give it 31. Um, wait, well, not 30. Why am I saying 31? Uh, <laughs> well, I, uh, let's see. I'd give it 35 gravitational waves out of 100. Yes. I'm so glad you didn't say 42. Because that's the meaning of life, right? That's the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. Yep. Thank you, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I will eventually watch that miniseries and maybe read the book. You should. One day. I I totally (laughs) should. So if you want to go ahead and find us, you can find AJ's YouTube channel at uh, Dota Normie. And also you can find uh, me, Jalaman, at uh, Jalaman22, the YouTube channel. And most likely this episode will be posted there as well as Podomatic, which you can find us at apologize to the podcast at podomatic.com. And we also have a Facebook page, which is um, apologize to the podcast on Facebook. And you can comment. And um, also um, from there, you can send any replies. And if you guys do want to send any feedback, uh, just let me know and I can read it and post it on the show. So, um, and if you've sent it to the old email, I think that one was hacked for apologize to the podcast. Um, oh, really? I, lo- <laughs> I, I don't know, know what exactly happened, but I got a lot of spam in there. So I'm going to try to change the password. And if anyone has sent feedback, uh, sorry if you sent it like back at episode three or something. Uh, <laughs> I'll, we'll eventually uh, read feedback if any was sent to us. So um, anyway, and obviously if you want to watch The Mangster, um, it's available in multiple DVD sets and it's also on YouTube right now. So, go enjoy it. So, signing off, um, I'll give you the honors, AJ. Apologize to the podcast. How old are you, Mr. Stanford? 35. Forgive me. I ask personal questions sometimes. Hello, this is Kenny B. This is Tom KW. And we are two of the hosts from the Podcast on Fire Network. You want Asian cinema in a podcast? Well, we got the solution for you. Because at the Podcast on Fire Network, there's seven plus shows for you to choose from. You want Hong Kong action cinema and audio commentaries? We got that. You want dirty Hong Kong cinema? We got that. You want the eternal question, what's Korean cinema answer? We'll answer that. The flagship show Podcast on Fire covers classic Hong Kong cinema. Everything from Bruce Lee to Jackie Chan, John Woo and Jet Li. Featuring in-depth discussions with an aura of fun. This is your primary stop in the podcast world for classic Hong Kong cinema. So join me, Kenny B and Tom KW and a cast of thousands at podcastonfire.com also available on itunes on stitcher radio and come chat with us on the podcast on fire network facebook group and on twitter at podcast on fire podcast on fire network it's asian cinema 
in a podcast. 